Good morning, everyone. Good morning to Brave Healer Productions. My name is Lisa Karasek, and I am here this morning with the fabulous Pamela Pine, and this is Brave Storytime. Um, Brave Storytime with Pamela Pine. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. And this morning, Pam is going to read her chapter, chapter one. So the important thing to know about this particular book is Pamela is the lead author. This is her book project. Um, she invited other authors to join her on this project. She's the lead author. And this morning, she's going to be reading the book's introduction and first chapter. And the chapter that she's going to be reading is titled, When Abuse Feels Like Love. And the book is Stop the Silence. So Pam, do you want to tell us a little bit about how this book came to be? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> well, this book came to be because of two acts or activities that came together. One was a very long history of mine working on child sexual abuse prevention, treatment, and mitigation through advocacy, education, training, and policy development and reform. And the amazing Laura DeFranco, who is the publisher of Brave Healer Productions. Laura had encountered someone who had been through this experience and it became a focus on her radar. And she called me up because I had written for other books that she published with other collaborating authors and she said, Pam, I, I think we should write a book. Uh, and we decided to name it Stop the Silence, Thriving After Child Sexual Abuse. And we were off and running. Uh, and, and so I started contacting colleagues of mine, reaching out on our various social media, placing calls of people who I had known for years and who were new uh, to me. Uh, and 20 of those people were survivors of child sexual abuse internationally. We have nine countries, by the way, represented here, uh, including, of course, the United States, but Zambia and Egypt and La and, and um, uh, New Zealand, um, other Pacific Islands, uh, Native America. So it's, it's well represented culturally, which is important because the world sees this in different ways, whether they should or shouldn't is another conversation, but they do perceive this different, this, this issue differently. So 20 people who came forward to write for this book are survivors of child sexual abuse. And the other three people, one being myself, I'm not a survivor. I'm an appalled uh, public health uh, specialist uh, that, that believed that this issue, believed that this issue needed more than a voice, needed major action. And, that, and my involvement with that started 23 years ago. Uh, so there's myself, uh, there is a protective parent who is writing as well, and there is one person as well who is writing from the position of both someone who helps survivors heal, he has programming, and also someone who has experienced harassment, sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. uh, so 23 of us, and we wanted to make sure that it was not only the stories that we were telling, but we were also providing at the end of every single chapter, the practice, a section called the practice, which provides information from these 23 authors, all of them, about what helps, what helped them heal, 
and what might help other people heal. So there is an enormous amount of information provided not only in each individual story about what this is all about and what happens to people and the trauma and impact that it causes, but also how do we heal? And that how do we heal, as well as the stories, all that information is geared towards both survivors to help them heal, as well as therapists, psychologists, um, uh, social workers, uh, uh, other types of healers who really can gain from a knowledge about what is possible in terms of assisting survivors of child sexual abuse to heal. Honestly speaking, even though people have a very, very good heart, this is a really complex issue. And so anybody working with others in this realm really needs to best understand what the issues are and the possibilities for actions and activities and therapies that can help heal. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. And thank you so much for this gift. I mean, this book, I is there going to be another or I, this is I, I don't know yet. It's not 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 anytime soon because I'm overloaded with work. <laughs> uh, but um there has been a suggestion that we do that. Um and this so book, this book has been received very, very well. Um, we have over 40, I think it is maybe 45 five-star reviews on Amazon so far. We've sent, we've, we have, have, uh, we have sent these books or they have been bought by people in various parts of the world, uh, including India and the UK, other parts of Europe. Um, New Zealand, um, Guam, uh, boy, where else? Egypt, of course, because we have a writer there. So it's it's getting and and various places in Africa. So it's really getting uh, fairly wide exposure. But as I half joke joke to people, there are an estimated an under probably a conservative estimated number of survivors in the United States of 50 million. If we've spent, if we have, we have sold or distributed, um, otherwise distributed um, hundreds of books, we've got a ways to go to reach the populations that really need to be reading this. So we're doing our darndest to make sure that Everybody who wants access to this book can get it. It is available in a hard available in a hard copy. It's available uh, as a um, as a, a virtual downloaded piece PDF, and it's also available as uh, a uh, audible as a as a read book. So anybody can access it for very inexpensive to the full price of the of the hard copy but if you if you want to read it and you don't have a lot of money it's available in other ways um, through amazon good thank you you've been you said you've been doing this work now is is when you say 20 something years is that stop the silence or just this work in general um, I, for 23 years, I've been working on the prevention, treatment, and mitigation of child sexual abuse and other adverse childhood experiences. My work, my full professional work, uh, also entails 23 more years before that mm -hmm. on all different kinds of critical and challenging world health issues. I have now worked literally around the world and every continent except the polar caps. Uh, so, uh, you know, I actually I'm headed up to, uh, to uh, Alaska, not quite the polar caps, but I'm headed to Alaska to do a training up there in November. Uh, so uh, my, my, my orientation, my orientation is global. 
Uh, I've been doing that for four, I've been working globally for 46 years, including the work on Stop the Silence for 23. So when I, when I think, when I think about this issue or frankly, any issue that affects us in a, in a major globe, in a major global health way, my brain goes to the world. It does not stay in the United States. I love that. So with all of those years of experience and all of this, all of these hours that you've put in, how did it feel to write this chapter, to be a part of it in such a tangible way? It felt both gratifying to get this information out. And there is always, I'm trying to be as honest as I can here about what this feels like. There is always a tinge of true sorrow and nearly desperation when it comes to this issue because there's so much damage done to so many people. And the stories are so heart-wrenching. I've heard thousands of these stories now, right? Thousands of them over 23 years. That frankly, if you're not touched by it all, uh, perhaps there's something a little lacking in your emotional response to issues. But that's also part of the reason why this issue has never gotten the attention yet that it needs, because it's so uncomfortable. We're putting the word child and sexual and sexual abuse in the same sentence, and we're doing it over and over again. And so for people to hear about this issue, whether you are directly affected or not, and frankly, everybody is directly affected, whether they know it or not. But if they don't know it, even if they don't know it, it's hard to hear. And and here, a little, little, tiny little anecdote. And, and it'll give you an idea of, of, of what sometimes I and other people are up against when we hear about these issues. So a few years ago, I was watching TV before I went to bed and I was in bed watching TV and my son came in and I was sobbing. And, and he said to me, what's wrong? And I pointed to the television set and it's one of those grueling commercials about those puppies and those kittens and the dogs and the cats that have been abused and are caged and are chained. And he looked at me and he said, turn it off. And that's what we do when we hear about these issues. Right. We want to turn it off. Right. Please go away. Please stop talking about it. But if we don't learn to talk about it, in a way that allows us to act. Basically what we're saying is I accept the, the situation and the conditions as they are mm. not acceptable. Oh. You can totally relate to those commercials and you have me starting already. So right, right, right. <laughs> totally understand. Wow, thank you for that. That's a great, um, that's a great connection. Okay, are you ready to read? I am. And okay. just to, you know, you had underlined, I'm, I'm starting with the introduction. It's not long, it's a couple of pages, but mm -hmm. it provides people with a good kind of the why, part of the why uh, okay. that this was done and why it's important. Definitely. So introduction to Stop the Silence, Thriving After Child Sexual Abuse. And may I say, Lisa, thank you so much for doing this. And thank I also want to thank, thank Laura DeFranco for being such a champion of, of healing in, in, all, in all means and modalities. So thank you both for, for doing this. Thank you. What, thank you for doing what you do. You're welcome. Whether you're a survivor of child sexual abuse or not, 
This book will touch you, teach you, and encourage survivors and others to reach out, speak out, and get the help that's needed to recover and thrive. Stop the Silence Thriving After Child Sexual Abuse provides heartfelt and poignant stories of abuse, recovery, and resiliency from male and female survivors of CSA or child sexual abuse and their supporters. It is a continuation of a new public health focus I took on in the year 2000 as a result of information that came in my direction initially from the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC. In January 2000, I sat in my office at an organization in DC that focused on international health, my chosen field. When information from the CDC appeared on my computer screen calling for research proposals on all types of interpersonal violence or IPV. I spent my career up to that point working on some of the world's toughest health issues around the globe. I started reading about the focus of child sexual abuse, given that my sister, Amy Pine, had acquired a reputation as a therapist who worked successfully with survivors of CSA. And I read, and I read, and I read. I was never exposed in school, public health school, or work to the issue of child sexual abuse or other types of childhood trauma, despite the below. Now, at that point, I'm gonna stop for a second. I'm gonna put in a caveat. At that point, at the point that I started with all of this, Lisa, I had gone through a PhD in public health communication, a master's of public health, and a master's of international affairs without one course in child trauma. How does that happen, right? Okay, so, Every year, millions of girls and boys around the world face sexual abuse and exploitation. Sexual violence occurs everywhere, in every country and across all segments of society. A child may be subjected to sexual abuse or exploitation at home, at school, or in their community. The widespread use of digital technologies can also put children at risk, but that's not the primary uh, area where child sexual abuse occurs, just FYI. Most often, abuse occurs in the hands of someone a child knows and trusts. At least 120 million girls under the age of 20, about one in 10 worldwide, have been forced to engage in sex or perform other sexual acts, although the actual figure is likely much higher. Roughly 90% of adolescent girls who report forced sex say that their first perpetrator was someone they knew, usually a boyfriend or a husband but many victims of sexual violence, including millions of boys, never tell anyone. In fact, also an aside, 52, more than 50, probably at least 52, sorry, at least 50%, sorry, I've got my stats messed up here. There are at least 50 million survivors, adult survivors of child sexual abuse, and the average age at which survivors tell if they tell anyone is 52 years old. Now the, the information, right, so they don't get help and it all affects their life and, and their circles and everything else for decades, right? Now the, re, the information I just read is from UNICEF. Um, it's from the Protection Sexual Violence Against Children um, focus. So CSA occurs when an adult, adolescent, or older child engages a child in sexual activity for which the child cannot give consent, is unprepared for developmentally, cannot comprehend, and or an activity that violates the law or social taboos of society. It encompasses a long list of various types of activities, usually perpetrated by those closest to the child, most of whom, but far from all, are men, most often from their families including voyeurism, inappropriate touching, showing or involving a child in pornography, insertion of objects, and rape. It often occurs from a grooming process and can occur in all kinds of circumstances, in the child's room, parents' room, bath time, classroom, locker room, alone with others, etc. General and formal reporting is low due to its behind-closed-doors nature, powerful differ power differentials, success at making the victim and families feel afraid and ashamed, and due to age, reduced or lack of understanding about what is happening. 
Even if a child reports the abuse, the shame, fear, lack of resources, or lack of understanding often prevent families from seeking help. Without proper intervention, the consequences of CSA often last through adulthood, affecting us all. CSA results in a host of poor outcomes for children, the adults they become, and society at large. CSA severely affects our neurology, a broad spectrum of mental and physical health outcomes, life expectancy, and the monetary cost to companies and nations. Other childhood trauma, physical abuse, psychological abuse, neglect, parent incarcerated, parental substance abuse, uh, which are part of the spectrum of ACE of adverse childhood experiences or ACEs per uh, Dr. Felidi and Dr. Anda, who did the original research. Uh, and people can find out more about that at aces2high.com on the web. They are also extremely damaging as well as multiplicative in terms of negative impact. So if you have one ACE, you probably have two, okay? If you have more than five, five or more ACEs, you are lucky to be walking around because it affects every aspect of your mental and physical health and even your life expectancy. So, in comparison to the problem, little is being done directly by providers or the public in an individual or a coordinated manner, but it needs to be, could be, and must be. Early on in my involvement in CSA, I wondered, given the public health impact, how could it be that neither I nor any of my public health colleagues I did ask knew anything about, were not taught anything about the issue? The numbers, the devastation, the outcomes for the children, adolescents, adult families, communities, and societies in the world. How could that be? I was shocked, horrified, and could not stop and focus first on awareness raising and advocacy since no one wanted to talk to me. I realized that if we could talk about this issue, it would be off. If we couldn't talk about this issue, it would be awfully hard to do something about it. I could clear a cocktail party in five minutes in those early days. I started working under the banner of Stop the Silence in 2000. We have gone over these 20 plus years to focus on an enormous array of awareness, education, and training programs. And since 2020, 2021, as a department of the Institute on Violence, Abuse, and Trauma, or IVAT, this book continues our worldwide efforts to bring awareness, understanding, prevention, help, hope, and healing to all. I hope this book helps you better understand the issue and the need, as well as find the compassion and wherewithal to join us in whatever way you can in protecting your and others' children, supporting survivors to heal, and bringing change to society. And that is the end of the introduction. Now, I am going to read my chapter that I wrote. It's the first chapter in the book, and it's called When Abuse Feels Like Love, Recognizing Signs and Arriving at Enough After Being Lured. Sometimes things are enough. They are just enough. They are just simply enough but it takes time, effort, and understanding to arrive at a place after being lured, manipulated, and molested. Padma, an Indian American beauty with light brown skin and long dark, dark hair, was born in the late 1990s and brought up in the heart of Los Angeles, near the beach, by parents from a good family who immigrated from Mumbai, India in the mid, -19, in the mid 1990s. This was right around the time that Bombay became Mumbai, named after Mumba Devi, the patron goddess of the Kofi Fisher, Koli Fisher folk, a simple people who migrated to the Indian islands from present day Gujarat. Outside of her family's food, their stricter cultural expectations socially, and her love of silk, silk kurtas, Padma was an all American girl. She was smart and empathetic, did well in school, and was industrious, taking on after-school job, jobs, working with underprivileged kids. She was social and knew a lot of kids, and they knew her and they liked her. She was wise beyond her years and a little withdrawn. 
She was 14 years old when she met Malcolm, English by birth, 10 years her se senior. He was handsome with dark hair and dark eyes, intelligent, charismatic, articulate, funny, engaging, alluring, and a Casanova, a storyteller by name, and a good one at that. The story of Padma and Malcolm started with a simple walk on the beach. The day was calm, the sun was shining, and the waves accompany, accompanied and encouraged by the slightest warm breeze were lapping at the shore, adding to the beauty and drawing anyone with any sensibility to the deep azure water. It was a place for the heart. Padma had gone out to take in the bluest of skies, water, and warm sand. It was early spring. Malcolm was there doing the same thing. She caught his eye. He meandered to her side. He smiled. She smiled back. They walked together. The walk and the time getting a snack went on for two hours, two and a half hours, with them rel relaying their brief life histories to each other. I come from a family with a handful of si siblings, said, said Malcolm at one point. We're all kind of artsy. I'm a writer and I sing with my guitar. Another is a painter and another is a filmmaker. I have spent the last few years working on a novel loosely modeled after my family. I'm hoping it'll be published and turned into a screenplay. I want to be famous, he said with a bit of a smirk. Saying it out loud made him feel slightly embarrassed, thinking that the idea was somehow small and self-indulgent. But Padma was intrigued. intrigued. Being in LA, after all, there was always talk about this kind of thing. Her classmates were influenced by the idea and the call of fame. In Padma's case, this was further supported by the fact that one of her uncles was a producer in Bollywood and had acquired a good deal of notoriety and connections in Hollywood. I might be able to help you, Padma said, looking up at him. She told Mal Malcolm about her family connections. Malcolm lit up. Would you like to read my work, Padma? I would really like that, she said. He promised to send it along to her in an email. They sat down to have a Coke at one of the fast food stands along the beach and continued to talk. He glanced down at her young hands. She was wearing three rings, all 22 karat gold, two on her left hand and one on her right, all made in India. What do those rings mean to you? Asked Malcolm. She smiled, feeling special and seen. This one, she said, pointing to the ring on her left ring, uh, left ring finger that had her initials on it, was a present for my mom and dad. This one, pointing to the one on her left pointer, was passed on to me when my grandmother died, she said. And this one with the garnet is my birthstone. I was born in January. They're beautiful, said Malcolm, and added, looking at her intently, but not too intently, and so are you. When Padma was not, now Padma was not sure of what to say or do, so she remained silent for the moment and looked down shyly. Before their first chance meeting ended, when Padma knew her family would be wondering where she was, Padma confided something very personal. He told her in quiet tones, that he was a survivor of child sexual abuse and that others in his family were as well. He shared this story with her, not in graphic detail, but the circumstances of how it had happened. An alcoholic mom who herself was abused and who was neglectful, and her brother also a victim of abuse as a child who was his abuser. To this, Padma was not sure of what to say again, but I'm so sorry. Before parting, Malcolm shared this. Everybody leaves me. Why does everybody leave you, asked Padma. I exhaust them, he said. For a third time that day, Padma didn't know what to make of this comment or what to say. As they walked on the beach, there was the barest of conversation between them until they parted but Padma felt like she would, had already fallen in love with this person who she hardly knew, who was too old for her, out of her cultural, cultural heritage, and definitively someone who parents would not be pleased with at all. But he was so different than anyone she'd ever met. He seemed so open, so vulnerable, and she liked that. No one had ever spoken to her in this way. She felt very special indeed. 
And so it had begun with a story, and so it continued, and so it ultimately ended. Over the next months, Padma continued to meet Malcolm on or near the beach. He showed up with presents, a small new gold ring, like a mini wedding band for her left pinky, a box of chocolates, read her his sentient writings, and sang love songs, playing his guitar while she hid it all from her family. How can I tell them, she thought. There was absolutely no way into that conversation, no way to have it if it were entered into. In private, she read his writings, commented on them, and continued to meet him clandestinely. Padma could not explain the feelings she was having. Her ears actually buzzed when she was around Malcolm. Her heart felt engorged, while the feelings in her stomach seemed to tell her to beware. She was almost nauseous. It did not all go together. On their fourth meeting, when Padma snuck out of the house after dusk, Malcolm put his arm around her and bent down for a kiss, which she returned. It was after that that Malcolm suggested they go skinny dipping under a partial moon. It's dark, he said, and no one is around anyway, and the water is so lovely, it would be fun. Padma did not want to seem too young for him. She wanted to feel grown up and available. And it was on that beach after their swim that Malcolm made his move. Padma was 14 and all of a sudden she was afraid of so much. She was afraid that she had made a mistake, that someone would find out, afraid that Malcolm would leave her. At that point, their relationship changed. And Malcolm himself seemed to, say, seemed to change. You will never meet anyone else like me ever, he told Padma one day with what seemed like a sneer with cruelty in his eyes and tone of voice. Padma did not understand the change in him. He demanded she show up when he wanted. While he seemed so available to her emotions in the very early days, he then refused to have conversations about her concerns and mocked her desire to talk, calling her weird and crazy. He demanded sex. She started feeling destabilized and off kilter and her fear seemed to mount. She began doubting herself and her thoughts became obsessive. She wondered, is there something I should be doing differently? What more can I do to make him happy? She recognized him as hugely talented, and she thought that perhaps if she just hung in there, she could reach him. His truly extraordinary talents, intelligence, and desire to do well seemed to make it possible, perhaps likely, that she could eventually help him, and she really wanted to. She felt a deep and heartfelt connection. This inspired her. Inspired her. She began writing poetry and sharing it with him. Padma followed through, uh, through on connection possibilities for him and identified people for him to reach out to. His book was published six months after they met to quite the fanfare. He pushed her to try to identify others who might be able to further his writing. She called her uncle in India to get more names. Hello, uncle. I'm doing some writing and I was wondering if there are people you think I should show my writing to in the U.S., he complied with names and contact information, with Padma, which Padma passed on to Malcolm and Malcolm used, noting that a close associate gave me your name, saying I had enormous talent, although they asked me not to identify them as they didn't want to appear burdensome, and it actually worked more than once. One night, standing by the ocean, Malcolm had been drinking before meeting up with Padma, at one point after she arrived, he turned to her and said, I feel like I want to hurt you. Wide in eyes and the quickest silent gasp registered her shock, sorrow, and hurt all at once. While there were changes in the relationship, Padma was stunned and merely replied, oh, I, I, I don't want to hurt you. When she brought it up while walking near the water a month later, to understand what was going on, he denied ever saying it. I would never say anything like that, he told her. Padman did not know how to think about this. She knew she wasn't crazy. She thought to herself, did he believe he never said that? Did he not remember saying it? She had no idea. Padma became more and more uncomfortable over the next months. Her sense of being both drawn to and repelled by him increased. 
She became scared of him, of what he might do or say. She began to draw away while still accommodating him in nearly every way she had been. As she did so, she began getting clandestine messages, clandestine messages, messages on her electronic devices, including ones with her past private conversations and actions mirrored, mirrored back to her. And her friends became, be, began acting strangely, breaking ties with her. She covered up the video access on her devices, except when she was talking on one of the platforms, exceedingly aware of being watched and overheard, stalked when she was on them. She began, she became hyper aware of everything she did and said on and off, on and even off electronic platforms. One good friend finally months after these messages began told her, all our friends have been receiving emails and texts on all different types of social media from someone we don't know. The person has been saying terrible things about you. They said you were coming on to older men and making a slut of yourself. Hushed, with head and eyes, eyes lowered, she added. And the teachers got wind of it too. She let Padma know that the media seemed tailored to each particular person, focusing on their relationship with Padma and what was important to them. Padma was devastated and talked for a long time to her friend about what was going on and what she was going through. Padma was amazed that no one exposed to the information except the one friend had contacted her to ask for, for her input. They just went along with what they were told. Padma became more and more exhausted, trying to deal with the toxicity, underhandedness, lies, and cruelty. She recognized how deeply sorry she was that Malcolm was abused, and the result of that had been so devastating. And she also, despite trying to reason with her reason herself out of it, still cared, but finally also realized she couldn't take it anymore. One day, after a year, when Padma met, met Malcolm at their spot. She told him, I can't see you anymore. Malcolm's eyes changed. Padma would describe that look afterwards as reptilian, but he said only, you will be sorry. You will never meet anyone like me again. You know you were the one who came on to me. Thereafter, for a long time, the clandestine electronic psychological abuse ramped up 10,000%. She could not get away. She needed the devices for school and her work with the kids, but every time she opened one of her devices, she got messages seemingly coming out of nowhere. Some were beautiful and complimentary, some were horrific or blatantly and grotesquely sexual. She tried to reach him, posting positive images he'd like. If he got it right, if she got it right, quote unquote, she got a positive message back. If wrong, she'd be punished. It went on and on. She shook and stopped sleeping through the night. She didn't know what to do. She pulled back from her involvements, friends, and even from school, feeling like she had no choice. Padma began getting sick physically and mentally. How could I have become, become such a vulnerable mess who wasn't paying enough attention, she thought. Her family was besides themselves, understanding nothing about what was happening. Sorry, I lost my place, it skipped. They took her to the best doctors who said she is suffering from a near emotional breakdown and they prescribed Ativan to calm her. Padma was still afraid to speak out knowing she could never explain what happened to her friends or, or, or her family and that things might get worse if she did. Her anxiety and fear nearly completely overtook her. While it was not something her family would have supported normally, when Padma asked, can I see a therapist, they complied. One was found, she began working through the tangle of feelings. Padma also began reading everything she could get her hands on to understand Malcolm's behavior and her own. Ultimately, she seemed to comprehend and work through her issues and began to heal. And she finally reached the point of enough. 
It was a long time, nearly two years. But if she was being honest, it was far longer than that before she began to feel somewhat like herself. By the time she graduated four years after it had all begun, she still struggled some. It was also a long time before she truly stopped blaming herself for what happened, which Malcolm tried so hard to ensure, realizing as the therapy, therapist had been telling her that adults are responsible for their actions and a child is never responsible for the actions of an adult. Adults have every responsibility to address their behavior and they are responsible for getting the help that they need. She could not help him enough. That's the end of the chapter. I don't know, and please tell me, Lisa, if I have a little time to read the practice. Please, yes, please. Okay. I would like to present the focus of the practice under the umbrella of something I call fundamental understanding and major management, as in fee fi fo fum F-U-M-M. First, the fundamental understanding part. There are some things we need to know as individuals, families, and community members. Additional information about child sexual abuse is in the introduction to this book, which I read. Please reread that if you get the book, and I hope you do. CSA, which occurs worldwide in huge numbers, profoundly impacts people's sense of, of the self and their lives. Outcomes for the children, adolescents, and adult victims and survivors can be terrible, even catastrophic. In many, perhaps most cases, including Padmas, there are people who could have recognized the signs and symptoms and helped. Also pertinent to the story above, while most of those who have been sexually abused do not go to, on to abuse others, it does put survivors of CSA at higher risk for being abusive in various ways. It would behoove us all to understand the overall subject and dynamic. It affects us all. There's a lot to learn about CSA, and now thankfully there's a lot of information available. Let's use that information to understand, prevent, and treat it. Barring major campaigns in the U.S. and elsewhere, which are still needed, we all need to take responsibility for knowing and helping. In a nutshell, we need to understand what CSA is, who it happens to and how, the grooming process, for example, who the perpetrators are, what the, what the often severe impact is on survivors, but also on their families and communities, how to protect our and our neighbor's children and get them the help, and, uh, the help that they and others need. And now for the major management part, as in F-U-M-M -M major management. I believe it equally important to say, I have heard people state that it's the victim's fault or that they can't understand how a person could possibly get themselves in Padma's position. Perhaps they would understand it more given her age. Still, people of much greater experience have found themselves in a similar position to hers, and perhaps more often than not as a result of someone else's traumatic childhood. Let's manage how we truly address CSA and other adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Let's make sure that we not only educate ourselves, our children in developmentally appropriate ways and our families, but let's also take a more active role in educating and training others. If you're not in this field, how can you do that? Some of it's fairly simple. If you go to the pediatrician, internist, family doctor, or dentist, or involved with legal matters, schools, politics, or any other field that involves impact on children or families, speak out. Ask, do you have a policy on child sexual abuse? And if they say no, ask them, why not? And how can I help you develop one? Please join me. Let's all do our part. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. Every bit of it, every word. I know there are parts that I can relate to, so I'm sure there are parts, if not all, that many people relate to. So thank you so much for that. Wow. Is there anything that you want to say 
on top of that to the audience, to the listeners? This is an incredibly difficult and very intricate and complex issue. If you think, you know, when you start reading, you got a grasp on it, all you have to do is pick up the next article. The final thing that I guess that's important to say is that even when we understand the dynamic, the sense of either empathy and or sympathy that needs to go along with this um, to understand and to act and to make a difference in individuals and communities' lives is really hard. And so I would encourage, I guess, everyone to try to open up their hearts and stand with the hurt and the devastation that comes along with this. Hopefully you haven't lived it, you know, hopefully you haven't lived it, but whether or not you have, we need to do something fundamental about it. And it starts with each of us. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So for the listeners, for the readers, just to let you know, this video will be up on the Brave Healer Production YouTube. And this is on Facebook in the live stream. So hopefully... You know, everyone who watched the live stream and the YouTube um, video everywhere, um, please add some questions in the comments, ask Pam questions, add some comments, speak to Pam. Pam, please go in later and answer everyone's questions. Please drop, go back and drop the links, where to find the book, how to get the book, um, you know, put it out there far and wide as much as you possibly can. Please respond to the Facebook Live and, um, you know, help Laura and Brave Healer Productions with the comments and questions on YouTube. This is so important. Thank you, Pamela. It is such an honor to be here with you today. Thank, Thank you. you. Really, Definitely. really appreciate it. Let's get it out there. If you buy a book, share it with somebody. Yeah. Or, or five people. Yeah. 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 So make sure you put the link in where to find the book. Um, oh, yeah. Every, okay. As much as you can and anything else. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I've got a question for you after we go off camera. If that's, uh, you've got a second. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me wrap this up then. Thank you so much, Pamela. Do you want to hold up the book so everybody can see? Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. A little closer, maybe because yeah, a little closer, a little, see, wrong, a little further out. There we there go. We okay, go. there we go. <laughs> oh, by you. the way, this dragonfly, this dragonfly is a pay is a is a watercolor painting by Sinclair Stratton, who does these gorgeous uh, watercolors of animals. And I reached out to Sinclair because the, the, the dragonfly is symbolic around the world for change and growth and transformation and a whole bunch of other stuff. And there's actually a whole page and a half, if it'll, a whole page and a half about the dragonfly in the book. And you can read about the dragonfly, which is really a nice, it's a lovely symbol. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Sinclair. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. All righty, Pam, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in to Brave Story Time today with Dr. Pamela Pine and Stop the Silence.